Good morning, everybody. We're the Garcias. We hope you enjoyed our silly video of our quarantivities. We really had a fun time making them. We would like to welcome you to the Riverside Sector of the Inland Empire Church of Christ Sunday service. We know at this time, it's a little bit unusual to be looking at your TV and watching church service. But uh, we hope that you had a little glimpse into our family and how we're dealing with it. I know that God has great things planned for us and that together, having a part of our family, being a part in here, is just a, a little glimpse of what I'm sure all of your families are doing. But at this time, we wanna go ahead and pray for our service. Go ahead and bow your heads. Father God, thank you so much uh, for your love and your mercy in our lives. Thank you for the opportunity of us being able to share a bit of our lives with everyone and uh, to really help people understand that uh, you're in control. Thank you so much uh, for the gifts and the blessings you give us. We pray for all the doctors and the nurses and the first responders. We pray for the people who are sick with this virus, and we pray for the members of our church and everyone else in the Inland Empire, God. Just really keep them safe. God, we thank you so much at this time. We thank you for the efforts of our uh, HOPE Committee and everyone making the masks and everything else. People working really hard, God, to really make a difference in our community. We love you, God. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Well, happy Sunday, guys. Good morning. Uh, it feels awesome to uh, be able to have uh, actual worship. And so uh, hopefully that you guys are at home, that you guys can sing along, praise God together, uh, and let's have some fun. Amen. Let's start with Everlasting God.
Hi, we're the Andersons. My name is Nick. I'm Gilma. I'm Mimi. And I'm Mela. We just want to say hi to our friends, Sayla and Lily. Hi, Kofi and Max. And hi, Asher and Jonathan. Hi, Aria. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Genevieve. And hi, Andy. All right, see you girls. Bye. Bye. Hey, friends. The effects of the coronavirus has led us to a time of uncertainty. And uh, some of you, like me, fear how this will affect our economy and in turn, how our families function. Uh, some of you have lost employment. Others of you, like us, have lost a significant amount of income. I, I know for Gilma and I, we'll be losing about $1,000 a month uh, for the foreseeable future. And uh, this can be quite challenging as we have different expenses that we were relying on that income for. You know, I'm someone that likes uh, safety and security. So what does this chaos and uncertainty do to me? Well, I'm one of those people that was at Costco way before they ran out of toilet paper and when the lines were manageable. I was at Costco the very next morning as soon as they declared California in a state of emergency. And I remember sending a picture to some of my friends of my grocery cart. And at that time, they thought I was crazy. So, you know, it's been, it's definitely been a roller coaster. There are days where I feel anxious and there are days where I'm in shock. And I asked Nick, is this really that bad? I mean, should I really be worried? Although my greatest fear is losing our loved ones, I can feel anxiety about the state of our finances and what lies ahead. Yeah, this time of uncertainty reminds me of the, uh, the time in Exodus where the Israelites uh, were really, really traveling through this wilderness into a land unknown. And uh, they began to get hungry, but also scared of running out of food and other resources. And so they grumbled against Moses. And uh, they said, hey, where's our food going to come from? How is God going to provide for us? And so of course God has mercy and compassion on them. And he sends down this manna from heaven. And, uh, but it came with a condition. You see, God said, don't hold on to any of it for tomorrow. Otherwise it's gonna go, go bad. And, and the point here is to teach you test you in order to know whether or not you're going to obey me and so of course the Israelites what do they do they stuff some away and sure enough they wake up the next morning and it's filled with maggots and it's moldy it's disgusting <laughs> you know the Israelites stored provisions uh, perhaps because they didn't truly believe that God loved them or that God would provide for their future in my desire to create safety I also want to take life in my own hands I want to store and I want to pre prepare for the future as much as possible. Although it's wise to prepare, holding back what belongs to God is untrusting. Just like the Israelites had manna that spoiled, the lessons that God is trying to teach us can also spoil if we do not obey Him. See, Moses tells us the moral of the story in Deuteronomy 8, verse 2. He tells him, he says, remember how the Lord your God has led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you, test you in order to know what was in your hearts, whether or not you could keep his commands. He humbled you and causing you to hunger and feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your forefathers had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, God commanded them to trust him, that he would provide for their daily resources as long as they were faithful to do what he had commanded them. It's hard to trust God in the midst of anxiety. In 1 John 4.18, it reads, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. The reality is that money for some of us represents stability and security. I know I feel more secure when our savings is plump. But the reality is that money and the false security that it provides, it's not true. The reality is that true security is found in God alone. And truly trusting in His love is what drives away our fear. We show God we truly trust Him when we keep our vows, even though it hurts. Yeah, so my question for you is, what might be God trying to teach or even test inside of you at this time? Maybe talk to the people that you trust. Uh, maybe even regarding your giving back to Him and how that reflects your trust in Him. 
Uh, at this time, guys, it's time to encourage one another. Have faith that the Lord will provide for our tomorrow, for our today, uh, each day our daily bread. At this time, I'd like to ask you to join me in prayer. Father, we know that all that we have is yours. Our employment that we have, or even that we no longer have, it, it came from you in the first place. Please help us to be faithful with, with what you've provided for us and to continue to give back to you in faith and to trust you just as you were calling your people long ago to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. At this time, we'd like to ask you to please pause the video and go ahead and give your offering as it is also a part of our worship. You can give in three ways. You can give through our website. You can go ahead and use your mobile app or you can text IERS at the number 77977. Thank you. Have a great day. All right, let's keep worshiping together.
Good morning, IE Church. Uh, I hope you are having a great time worshiping in your homes with your family. It's so cool to see the Andersons and the Garcias on our service today. Uh, we're, we're learning new things here with this online thing. We're learning how to add things, get, get our congregation involved. Uh, so please be patient. We are trying to uh, get better at this. I would way rather be talking to all of you, uh, but it, it's a lot more difficult to talk to a camera. If you haven't tried it, you can try it. Um, but we miss you guys, and uh, I am excited to dive into the scriptures today. And I, so I hope you're ready. I hope you got a Bible before you, and um, we're going to jump right in. You know, when I was younger, um, I remember this time when my grandparents and my parents took my brother and I to a farm. And on this farm, you could pay a little bit of extra money to ride a donkey. Uh, now, I know what you're thinking. Donkeys aren't as cool as horses, but when you're a young kid, anything with four legs that's bigger than you that you can ride is pretty sweet. So <laughs> my grandparents paid a little bit of money for my brother and I to be able to go on this donkey ride through a field. And I remember my brother and I sat on this donkey and it wouldn't move. And that was it. We paid money to sit on a donkey. And uh, it was very disappointing. And so I was ready to get off. And my grandma saw my brother and I's frustration. And she too was frustrated, thinking, I want to get our money's worth. And so she makes a decision uh, to smack the rear end of this donkey, thinking, okay, it should get it to move a little bit so that my grandchildren can enjoy their donkey ride. Well, it did move, just not in the way she thought it was going to. Uh, upon smacking this donkey, the donkey threw its rear legs in the air, uh, launching my little brother off the donkey. Now, I was sitting in the front, so I was able to grab onto the, the reins of the donkey. My brother had nothing really to grab onto, and he flew off this donkey and smacked on the ground. You know, I learned a really valuable lesson from my grandma that day. Don't smack a donkey. Don't smack an animal that you're riding on. It's just never a good idea. Now, you might be thinking, where in the world is he going with this story? And to be honest, I'm thinking a little bit of that too right now. But my connection to it is today we're going to read in the scriptures a story of Jesus taking a ride on a donkey into Jerusalem. And in the scriptures, this marks a holiday or a moment that we know as Palm Sunday. And this is the moment Jesus enters into the city of Jerusalem uh, where people are acknowledging who he is. This is right after Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the death, but it also kicks off the start of something we know as the Passion Week, right? Just a few days after this, Jesus meets the cross and, and goes through everything we know he goes through uh, that, that led to his sacrifice for us. And uh, so today we're going to study this out in John 12. You know, the Gospels have a very big focus on this last week of Jesus' life. The, the Gospel of Matthew, two-fifths of that book, focuses on Jesus' final week. The Gospel of Mark, three-fifths focus on that final week. The Gospel of Luke, a third of the book, focuses on that final week. And the Gospel of John, almost half of the book of John, focuses on this final week of Jesus' life. There's four Gospels, 89 chapters. Only four of those chapters deal with before Jesus is 30 years of his life. Uh, the rest of the 85 deal with the last three and a half years of his life, focus on Jesus' ministry. And 29 of those chapters in the Gospels cover, focus, and really hone in on Jesus' final week here on earth, known as Passion Week. And so we're going to pick up in John 12, and this, this starts, this kicks off uh, the, the, the kind of events that led up to his crucifixion and ultimately to his resurrection. So turn with me to John chapter 12, and I'm going to be starting off here in John chapter 12, verse 12. It reads, The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out there to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, 
seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples didn't understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. And so the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. You know, if you just breeze through scripture and don't uh, really, really try to dig at the significance of this moment, you can miss some powerful things. You know, today I want to talk about some life lessons we can learn from this ride on a donkey. I mean, you think about this donkey. This donkey is carrying the Son of Man on his back, heading into town. And I believe there's a couple things we can learn from this whole situation, and we can really learn about Jesus if we take the time to dive in uh, to this scripture. You know, the first life lesson I think we can learn from this situation we see Jesus in here is that Jesus is more appealing than religion. Let me say that again. Jesus is more appealing than religion. You know, for Jews in this time, there was three festivals that all Jews were, were obligated to be in Jerusalem for those festivals. It was the Passover, the Pentecost, and the Festival of Tabernacles. And so in this situation, Jews from all over surrounding areas have gathered in Jerusalem for this, the festival celebrating Passover. Uh, they're celebrating God delivering them from Egypt uh, in a time of slavery where there was, the, and, and God sent plagues and all these different signs and, and God delivered them from that time. Um, and that's what they're celebrating. They're celebrating kind of the, what is seen as the uh, center, the core uh, of their faith, of their, of their religious system. Um, but for many of these people, over time, it became the same festival every time. The same paths to get there, the same prayers, the same celebration. It, it just became repetitive over and over again. And so I think similarly, similar to our time now, people back then, man, they wanted something real, something authentic, right? Something that was, wasn't just... A repetitive or like a, a chore or an obligation that you could do mindlessly and so here comes Jesus coming into town and in the midst of this festival for celebrating Passover people flock to Jesus going hey there's something new there's something real there's something that is worth it you know throughout Jesus's ministry the structure and the traditions of religion constantly he came into clash with. Jesus clashed with the religious structure of that day. You know, I'm reminded of Matthew 15 when Jesus and his disciples sit down and, and Pharisees, the teachers of the law, are, are persecuting the disciples, wondering why are you negating the traditions of our elders because of how they didn't or did or did not wash their hands. And Jesus looks at him and goes, how are you negating the commands of God with your traditions? There was a constant clash with religion and Jesus. You know, some of those differences or the reason those things clash so much is for a couple different reasons. One, I think religion focuses completely on the outward, right? How you look, how you sound, right? The, the, the way you talk to the teachers of the law, right? Has a lot to do with fixing the outward appearance and making sure you look good and are put together and are holier than thou type of stuff. Whereas Jesus was, was very focused on the heart, very focused inwardly, right? Jesus said things like, why is there evil in your heart? Or overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or I remember in, in Matthew 23, when Jesus encounters just some religious people, he tells them, you hypocrites, you worship me with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. See, religion is a lot about the outward, whereas Jesus is all about the inward. 
you know, religion also focuses a lot on the all you can't do, right? Thou shall not kind of mentality. And uh, that leads to just viewing God and spirituality as kind of a structured rules and regulations. Whereas Jesus is, hey, come, come as you are and see all the things I can do and have done. See what I can do in your life and, and how I've already won. And so uh, Jesus his focus is on, look at what I can do and what I can do in your life. Religion is kind of a structurized way of going, here's all the things you can't do. You know, religion also has a very prominent way of just keeping people out. I think about the temple during these times uh, that we're reading about, where there was barriers to how close you could get in proximity proximity with God uh, depending on who you were. So if you were a Gentile, you were on the outskirts of the temple, right? You were farthest away. If you were a Jewish woman, you got to be a little bit closer. If you were a Jewish, Jewish man, you got to be a little bit closer. And if you were a priest, you got to be the closest. It was really good at keeping people out based on who you were. Whereas Jesus came into contact with with everyone, especially those who are outcasted by society and by the religious structure. And so while religion is, is focused on it, depending on who you are, there's, there's barriers to how close you can get. And Jesus is, man, everyone can come to me. Uh, I am the way. Uh, which I think another thing is religion can focus on, you've got to work your way in. You know, uh, how, how good have you been? If you've been bad, you've got to kind of pay a penance. You've got to do things to be in right standing and, and follow the rules and be a certain way and talk a certain way and act a certain way. And Jesus goes, I am the way. If you want to get to God, just, just come to me. And so you see that there's just this constant clash between religion and Jesus. And Jesus, he frustrated the religious system. And we see it in verse 19 in, in John chapter 12. The Pharisees are looking at Jesus coming to town going, Man, this has gotten out of hand. Look at this guy. We're not getting anywhere. Jesus and religion came into clash a lot. You know, you might not call yourself religious, but we can sometimes lean heavily on a sort of religious structure. Things are very different right now. We're not doing church the same. We're not... We're not doing, we're doing things very differently. And for some of us, that frustrates us. It, it, things should be different. It should be this way. And we should be doing more things how we used to do. And, and that could be a very frustrating thing. But here's, where I want to ask, here's what I want to ask you is, can you be missing Jesus in our reliance on a structure for our religiosity? You know, religion and Jesus constantly clash. And that's why in John chapter 12, and I believe for our world today, Jesus is way more appealing than religion. Second thing I think we can learn from this ride uh, Jesus is going on into the city of Jerusalem is that scripture is more reliable than opinion. Scripture is more reliable than opinion. You know, almost everybody has an opinion about Jesus. Whether they're frequent churchgoers, sold out followers of Christ. I mean, everybody has an op opinion about who Jesus is and how he works. And that was very similar to the time in the Bible. I mean, Jesus even pulled his disciples aside and, and asked them, Hey, who do people say I am? Some say a prophet. Some say you're Elijah. And, and, and the opinions rolled in. I mean, some people even said that Jesus was from Satan. Right, some there. There was people that saying Jesus is not from God, and and there was all sorts of different opinions about who Jesus was in that time and in our time here today. You know, but opinions, they're everywhere. Everybody has one. You know, I hear opinions all the time, and I'm sure you do too. And uh, as, as, some, as strong as someone may feel about an opinion, it doesn't make it any more true. You know, you read here in John, and John is directly quoting scripture in this instance we see here with Jesus. As Jesus is walking through the streets on the donkey and people are putting these palm branches before him and they're shouting, uh, Hosanna, 
There is our king, Hosanna, meaning uh, save me now, save us now. And, and he's walking through the street. That, that's, a, that's a direct quote from Psalm 118. Uh, but even more importantly, when you skip over to uh, verse 14, we see uh, a, a quote, a reference to a prophecy in Zechariah 9.9, 9, where it says, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's coil. You know, my first question in reading this situation is, why a donkey? Why, why did Jesus choose a donkey to ride into? And like I said earlier, wouldn't a horse be so much cooler or a chariot or, or some sort of Maserati version uh, of a vehicle back then? Why, why a donkey? Well, when you read the scriptures and when you read Zechariah 9.9, it's easy to see that that, that donkey proclaimed the identity of, of Jesus. See, that prophecy in Zechariah 9.9 was, was made and written down over 500 years before this situation we're reading about right now. And so the fact that Jesus rode in on a donkey confirming the prophecy that was written long before he showed up showed that he is the king. He is the Lord. Now, interesting fact here, kings did ride donkeys. Uh, they rode donkeys in, in times of peace. They rode donkeys into town when they had a, a peace offering to offer to a group of people. Now, kings rode horses when they were coming to deliver war terms, right? Which we see that in Revelation 19 when it says Jesus will come back and he will bring upon war. And in that situation, he is riding a horse. But in this situation, this donkey is confirming Jesus' identity that, that was written in prophecy long before he came about, confirming that he is to bring peace. He is here to save. You know, right there in those verses, uh, after it, it records the, the prophecy from Zechariah 9, uh, we see that it says the disciples didn't quite understand what was happening at first. And uh, they, you know, it says they did finally understand later on when Jesus was, was glorified. So after everything went down, they, oh, that, that's what's happening. But I, I find a little bit of comfort in knowing that, man, the disciples didn't really even know what was going on here. And uh, I think I find comfort in that is because, man, sometimes it takes me time and time again of reading scripture and studying out to really understand what I'm supposed to understand. And I think the trick there is, is sometimes when we don't understand the Bible or we don't understand scripture, we oftentimes are we're tempted to or more inclined to revert to opinions about Jesus, opinions of how he works, uh, of how he th what he thinks of you, of where you stand with him, and opinions are not as reliable as scripture. You want something secure in your life. You want something on firm foundation. Well, that's the scripture. And we see it proved out here in this, is, is in this passage as Jesus confirms his identity from the prophecy in Zechariah 9. You know, when you, when you live your relationship with God based off of opinions or thoughts or maybe suggestions, it's, it's shaky. It can develop insecurity. It can lead you to thoughts of, man, where do I stand with God? And, and who is Jesus? And what do I really believe about him? But when you're led by the scriptures, and maybe it won't happen right away. Maybe it'll be like disciples. It'll, it'll take you some time, which is absolutely okay. But it's so much more reliable than opinions. We love to share our opinions. Uh, some of us more loud than others. But here's a question. Are, are there opinions about God, about Jesus, that can be interfering with your relationship with him? That can be interfering with a stable, concrete knowledge of who Jesus is. Opinions can be misleading. And just relying on someone else's word, even mine, is not good enough. Scriptures are way more reliable so from this donkey ride, from this ride into Jerusalem, we've learned that Jesus is more appealing than religion. We've also learned that scripture is more reliable than opinion. And I want to close out with this last life lesson we can learn from, from this situation. I believe that, that that is following 
is more important than inspection. Following is more important than inspection. You know, John does this thing in his Gospels and his writings where as Jesus is speaking to people and their situations with Jesus, he tends to record the different groups of people and how they respond in his writings. And in this situation, where there's four groups of people and, and, and how they respond is listed in here. The first group is the disciples. Now it does say they didn't understand it at first, but then they realized. Now this was actually the only group of people that were actually following Jesus during this time. They didn't get it right away. They certainly weren't perfect, but they did bring their inspection to a conclusion and that led them to follow Jesus and not just observe him. There's some other groups here. There's a group of people that witnessed Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. They saw it, they were hyped, and so how they responded is they told a bunch of people. They probably went out to the town, to their jobs, to their families, and, and different people, anybody who listened, like, hey, we saw this guy raise someone from the dead, right? And now that can be mistaken as they're like, they're worshiping and they're praising, but I think it's more of a, they're sharing something crazy they saw. Like if you saw something crazy on the street and you were just telling people about it, right? That was that group. And then there's a group of people here that are watching Jesus coming to Jerusalem that were just here because they heard of the stuff Jesus did. They heard that he raised Lazarus from the dead. If you heard someone was doing something wild or out of this world, I'm sure you'd run to see who this person was too. And so this group was just kind of there out of, out of hype to observe. And then there's the Pharisees, this religious group of people. And they respond in a, in a cynical way, right? We see in verse 19, they're frustrated. Again, Jesus has clashed and scripture has become way more valuable than opinion. And they're, they're frustrated uh, about Jesus and they don't really like, and they're observing this all go on and they're not too happy. And so we see out of these four groups of people, like I said, only one of them is actually following. The rest are observing. Maybe they're excited. Maybe they think it's really cool. Maybe they're entertained. Maybe they're there out of frustration and pain. Whatever it may be, the other three groups are just inspecting, just observing. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with observing. In fact, I think we've all got to observe before we throw ourselves into something. But the hard thing is when you stay at the observation level, when all you do is observe Jesus but never really conclude it with following Jesus, you become stuck. And that, that looks like maybe you're just, you just go to church because and I want to see Jesus. I, I sit, I listen to the songs, but I don't really follow through. I don't really conclude with following. You know, during Jesus' time here on earth, a lot of people observed him, but not everybody's life was changed because of him. And I believe that has to do with what we're talking about right now is because observation stated observation and it never concluded to following. Where are you at today? Are you stuck in an inspecting or observation mode of, of Jesus? Or have you led your observations to lead you to follow Jesus? You know, I believe that this is something that even if you've been a follower of Jesus for many, many years, I think we can all kind of sink back into an observation mode where I, I look at Jesus from afar, I, I watch what he's doing, I learn about him, I love reading about him or seeing him, but there's this hesitancy or lack of conclusion to actually following. See, I think that could be something that you can revert back into even if you've at once been sold out for Jesus. It can be very easy to slip back into just a bystander trying to witness something cool and powerful, but following him is way better than just observing him. It's, it's so much more powerful. The impact it can have on your life and what Jesus can do through you once you decide to follow him is immeasurable. So I believe that we must learn to allow our observations to conclude with following and not just leave ourselves inspecting the life of Jesus on the side. Hope you and your family were able to have a really connecting time of worship today. I do want to give you a couple announcements, some things to put on your radar. We will have a link in the description below for all the children 
and I know they're missing off uh, missing out on kids kingdom and classes and stuff like that and so we do have content for your kids uh, for them to be able to connect with God and build their relation and their understanding of God and so please keep a lookout for the link uh, listed below uh, for resources for your children uh, we also throughout our week we are going to have devotionals posted on our Facebook page uh, these will be short little devotionals but we just want to continue to put out um, some spiritual biblical content uh, to you guys during this time so if you haven't already please go to our Facebook page ie church dash Riverside and you can watch the videos we've already posted but you can also stay tuned for devotionals that will be released this week we love you guys have a great Sunday
can be beautiful out of me.